Thank you for joining us on Facebook Live today. This is Stand Up LD. We're so excited you're here to join us. I know this is our second go at trying to do our Stand Up LD Live event for advocating for your child from a parent's perspective, a father's perspective. We're so thankful to have Brian Rigg here with us and Stephen Urout and Eric McGarity to share what it's like to have uh, to have LD yourself and then also to parent children who have learning differences and, you know, parent them from childhood all the way up into, uh, you know, adulthood and launching them into the real world. So today we're going to be doing a panel discussion talking about all things when it comes to, you know, parenting and your own journey and all those things. So first off, I wanted to uh, thank our sponsors. We have two sponsors for Santa Fe LD. We have uh, Fairhill School. We also have Shelton. And before we get too far along, I was hoping we could go around and introduce everybody. So if we could do just a quick introdu introduction of each person, kind of tell you a little bit about yourself. So if we could go ahead and start with Eric. You want me to start? Okay. Yes. I get favoritism here. You see that? Sorry. You see that, guys? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so uh, I'm Eric McGarity. Some of you guys may know me. Um, I am uh, a, a dyslexic. Uh, I am a father of four, of course, with Heather. Uh, we um, have had an amazing journey. I'm also um, an artist by trade. I went to uh, graduate school to uh, be a sculptor. And then I did a career change and started a digital marketing agency. Um, it's been 13 years now, uh, 12 and a half, 13 years since I started my marketing agency called Globe Runner. Um, I now run that agency full time and have a, a staff of people that work uh, in that company. So it's been a really interesting journey, kind of growing from, you know, being an independent or an artist, working with my hands to now managing and leading a team of people in a technical industry. Um, so I have a lot of insight there from, from that perspective and, and a lot of insight as a dyslexic adult and a dyslexic kid. But uh, raising kids with LD is a whole new experience. My oldest son, 14, I have identical twins that are 12, and my daughter is eight, and all four are dyslexic and, and have other related learning differences uh, to various extents, but dyslexia being the most prevalent with all of them. So uh, that's my journey in a nutshell, and uh, I'm excited to uh, share, share more details on my perspective. Um, when we hand it over yeah, to hand it over to Brian, go ahead, Brian. Yeah, and thanks again, guys, for having me. My name is Brian Mark Rigg. Uh, I have dyslexia as well and uh, ADHD. When I was a young child, I had a uh, severe speech impediment uh, as well. It took me many years to to learn how to speak properly. Uh, I have the dubious honor of having failed first grade twice. Wasn't supposed to get out of high school. I uh, went to a special school uh, here in Fort Worth uh, called Star Point that got me back on track. Eventually, I got to uh, Yale University where I did my undergraduate uh, degree, and then I went on to Cambridge and got my master's and PhD. I was a uh, college professor for many years. I've written five books on World War II and the Holocaust, uh, and then I uh, transitioned um, 17 years ago onto Wall Street. Uh, worked at Credit Suisse, the Swiss bank. And then I, a few years after that, developed my own private wealth management company. And so now I manage people's stocks and bonds and cash. Uh, I have three uh, children that have all uh, different, uh, you know, flavors of AD, uh, HD, uh, and dyslexia. Uh, except for my youngest child, he does not have uh, dyslexia. Uh, they've all went to Shelton, a school here that focuses on uh, LD issues. And, um, you know, it's, it's been a, um, a rehashing of a lot of things that I had to uh, do when I was a young kid raising my kids, but I think I got them a lot further along early on uh, than what I had because uh, I had that experience. So it's been, a, it's been an interesting journey taking care of these kids. One is 21, one is uh, 18, and the uh, youngest is, is 14. But they all have healthy self-esteems, and they're doing well, and they've embraced who they are. That's awesome. That's great. So um, thank you for having me on here. Uh, again, I, I enjoy uh, our time together. Uh, my name is Stephen Yearout. I am the um, 
president and, and founder of a podcast called Empower Dyslexia. Uh, I have dyslexia and ADHD. I have three boys, two of which are uh, have dyslexia and ADHD. Um, I was diagnosed in third grade of having uh, dyslexia and uh, received zero help from the school district at that time. Uh, I remember them telling my mom that, you know, that, yeah, there are special schools that you can go to. There are uh, programs that some school districts have. However, our district has no uh, dyslexia remediation or intervention type programs. So school, um, although I was an athlete, um, I always joke and say I was a star athlete for the first six weeks uh, because I was able to play for the first weeks and then uh, no pass, no play took, a, took effect and uh, that was my sports career for that year. Um, school, the, the education piece of it was very frustrating for me because uh, I felt like and I'm not saying this to be conceited, I felt like I was as smart or smarter than pretty much all the other students in the room. However, I couldn't perform like they did. I just didn't understand why, and it was frustrating. Um, and at about 10th grade, I finally had had enough. You know, school didn't have anything for me anymore, so I dropped out of high school. Um, didn't know what life was gonna present. I always felt like I was gonna go to college I actually wanted to go to either SMU or, or UT. Those were the two colleges as a child that I wanted to go to um, and thought that I would, would have done it. Uh, it took me about six years uh, to go back and get my, as I call it, my good enough diploma, GED. Um, and then I just kind of you know, started my own business at, at one point in time uh, doing IT uh, consulting. And it wasn't until I had children uh, that I really started thinking about dyslexia and understanding exactly what I was dealing with or what I dealt with. Um, my middle son was diagnosed first in third grade. Um, once I found out how little has changed, from the time that I was diagnosed to current. Uh, although there's been a huge strides in trying to understand and give them support, not a whole lot has changed. Um, that's where the Papa Bear came out. And I was like, no, y'all, y'all basically destroyed my family by not providing support and help that we needed. I'm not going to allow you to do that to my kids. So that's where the advocacy really started with, with myself and my wife. And, you know, then I started looking at all the other kids that didn't have parents that understood what was going on in the system and understood that it took us hundreds and hundreds of hours to understand how to properly advocate for your child, what type of services they can receive, what the legal uh, rights were for your child. And then I started going, well, how do I do knowledge transfer? How do I give the other parents that are out there that don't have that amount of time to really do deep dives into what's going on and provide support for their children? And that's how Empower Dyslexia came about, was I wanted to make sure that I could take the knowledge that I've gained over all the research and, and uh, hundreds of hours studying this and be able to provide it to the parents out there in a very nice, neat package and watching a video. Absolutely. That's very well said. And you've done amazing things to, you know, you, you've created an amazing podcast to help in, empower others. And uh, you've definitely empowered yourself. You've got an amazing story to share today. Um, so I love your story. So, um, Part of what I was hoping you guys could share too was what it was like, you know, from that moment of, you know, you guys grow up uh, dealing with your own learning difference and what that was like uh, going to school, the struggles that you had. Fast forward, uh, you have a family of your own, you start having children, 
and you find yourself um, coming to the crossroads or realization that you need to get your child or children tested or your children start getting tested or start becoming identified or diagnosed with um, these learning differences. So if you guys could share a little bit about what that journey was like, um, Eric, if you want to start and then go around, share what that journey was like. Um, and I think if we could kind of go down that yeah. path. Yeah. So I definitely uh, can relate to that question. I, um, what's funny is, you know, so I'd gone to grad school and um, everybody was like, oh, wow here's this kid who was like really dyslexic as a kid and we didn't think he was going to do that well. And then he went to grad school. Let's get him on stage and have him come speak to people. And so uh, mm. my alma mater, which was Shelton, I had gone to as well. Um, I, I, they said, hey, come speak to our students. So I gave a talk to students. It went really well. Everybody thought it was great. A couple teachers like had me speak at other schools. I went to a parent support group, gave talks there. Lo and behold, I ended up kind of becoming like a, a motivational speaker in this space. And I had done that for years uh, and I'd given probably a hundred something speeches by the time that Keegan was old enough to, you know, be identified. And so I thought I totally had it handled. Like I was emotionally ready for anything. I was super cool with being dyslexic. It was not a problem anymore. It was like my superpower and everything was good. Keegan was di diagnosed and I, it hit me like a ton of bricks. I was not ready for that moment. The, the way that I felt and the level of pain and anxiety that I had, uh, I just, I wasn't ready for it. And I just remember one night uh, we were, we were in a car, in the car, pulled over in a parking lot talking about it. And I was just, bawling my eyes out, worried that he was going to have the same experiences that I had. Um, and I just wasn't ready for that. I wasn't ready to deal with watching him go through that level of trauma that I'd gone through. And that really was a wake up call for me as a parent to go, gosh, I need to do something different. I need to, you know, help him have a better experience than I had, uh, much like you indicated when you introduced yourself, Stephen. So Anyway, I'll pass the baton. Uh, maybe I'll lead that into Stephen. Stephen, you want to take it? Sure. Um, you know, it was it was really weird. I I went I went to my well, my youngest, well, my two youngest, my middle, my youngest. I went to their school, which happened to be the elementary school that I went to. Um, and the first time walking in there as an adult. I started seeing, or, and I would, I was over, um, I had a feeling coming over me. I could sit there and remember the things that people had said to me or having to go to the office. Um, and, and Eric and Heather, you know, you and I have talked about this before. I was paddled every day in third grade for not turning in my homework. And to think about that now, I'm just like, how barbaric it, that is mm -hmm. to paddle a child because you're not providing support to help them. Um, so much like you, Eric, what you were talking about, I wanted to make sure that my child never went through or my children never went through what I went through growing up. And, you know, we did a podcast called Dyslexia Stole My Life. And I really felt like dyslexia, not dyslexia, because dyslexia is, is one thing and it's not being able to read spell. It's a language disability. And the, the overflowing piece of that, meaning not being able to do well in school, that overflows into your home life, that overflows into obviously your extracurricular activities, those type of things, um, that's that absolutely stole what our life could have or should have been. And I wanted to make sure that my children never, ever had to go down that path and feel those type of feelings or have to deal with the mental anguish that goes along with it. You know, because it's great that we can, we can go to a private school or this or that. But by the time that children generally get diagnosed, 
are identified is third grade, they've already had four years of failure, K through third grade. So there's there is mental um, issues, psychological issues that happened of four years of failure yeah. in the school system. So you know that's really why we do what we do. Absolutely. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. So, yeah, so you know, when our daughter was born, uh, my first child, we had a lot of issues early on that we knew we were going to have to deal with. And, and now research shows that, you know, uh, ADHD and dyslexia is, uh, according to one study I have cited in some of my work, 80% uh, heredit uh, hereditary uh, aspect is passed on, uh, 80%, 80% of the children. So, you know, our kids, basically, if you have ADHD, there's a high probability that you're going to have it with your, your kids. And um, uh, so uh, when, when our first one was born, Stephanie and I, my ex-wife, we, we started looking at therapy. We started looking at schools. We didn't know about Shelton uh, at, at that time, but we knew we had to just work the, work the problem and, and make sure they had teachers that understood what was going on. Uh, we went to one school here, and afterwards, the, um, uh, the, the principal who had interviewed Sophia by herself basically came out to us and said, we don't know what your kid needs, but we know we definitely don't have it. Wow. And we later, we later found out that Sophia had crawled underneath the table and licked her ankle, which, you know, that, that didn't help her, our case very much. And then later on uh, in that day, we drove, we had already gone and looked at like seven or uh, six or seven other schools and things were hock a day and things were not looking good. And we drove by one public school and Sophia looked up in the rearview mirror as we passed by it and she asked mom, mommy, maybe that school will take me, you know, so she was feeling that pressure. Luckily, we found Shelton. Uh, they, you know, diagnosed her early on with severe dyslexia and um, uh, ADD and, and sensory integration issues and some anxiety issues. And we just said, hey, this is how your brain works. You're going to be fine. You just got to figure out how, uh, how you learn best and build up that self-esteem. And, you know, later on, fast forward now, when she uh, applied to college, she had a 1570 on her SAT. When she went over to China a few years ago, in nine months, she learned Chinese. Uh, and so she's a brilliant child. And I think getting that self-esteem early on and just say, okay, hey, you know, like you were saying, Stephen, you felt just as smart as everybody else. You just didn't have the tools to compete with them. Well, we were able to give that to Sophia, when our uh, second child was born, my first son, Justin, who was the Tasmanian devil, it was just like, I was looking at him, I was like, okay, hey, this is me, you know, and just get him into sports, make sure he has an outlet for that energy, make sure he's, you know, here again, self-esteem is good uh, for, for these, these kids to be able to tell them your brain is a race car drain, brain, you just got to learn how to put on the brakes. And, uh, and, you know, I had the theory already going that the ADHD mind and dyslexic mind are actually superior hunters, superior warriors. I mean, the highest level of these people in, in communities in, in America that I've studied are special forces, fighter pilots, and prison. So, you know, we want to focus on the first two type of high activities, you know, whether that be an EMT or being a trauma doctor or being a military officer and so on. So early on, I kept on focusing on that positive aspect because yes. I was given such negative feedback. I was diagnosed actually with MBD, minimal brain damage, and HLD, hyperkinesis learning disabled. That's what's in my child study report in Fort Worth. And I was bound and determined that the label of disordered or disabled or learning disabled was never going to be thrown really on my kid. I kept on focusing on you're learning different. We're going to be fine. You know, you, you're struggling with something, you know, come talk to us. And luckily, we got them into a community, Shelton, which is a school that focuses on kids with LD, where everybody's in the same boat. So, you know, later on, then when we transition out of the community into mainstream education, they already had that foundation that they could do it. And so uh, being armed with the negative experiences, like Stephen was paddled a lot, I was too. I got licks all the time. And just for being who I was, uh, not because I was really being a, a bad kid, 
Uh, luckily, our schools don't do that anymore. But I had a lot of shame and a lot of fear growing up. And I was bound and determined I was not going to let my kids go through that. And I think we've done a very good job. My younger son, he had mild form ADD and, uh, and some anxiety. And we had him at Shelton, transitioned him out very quickly to mainstream school. But after going through two kids already, we were already kind of armed and ready with therapists and with uh, the schools that we needed to go to if we needed to go down that road. Uh, he's been the easiest one. You know, two out of my three kids got the genetics, really. You know, Ian is very mild. Uh, but that's what we did with our kids to really make sure that they got the resources they needed to make sure that they felt like they were not defective. That's critical. Mm -hmm. That they're just different. And when you tell them, hey, these are the things that you do that are remarkable uh, for, uh, that other people can't do. You know, you're the people that change society. You're the people who think out of the box. You're the entrepreneurs. You're the leaders. You're the, the great athletes and so on. And just continually hammer that into these kids. You know, my daughter, getting back to her, when she was 70, I had her do martial arts since she was five years old. She won the uh, world championship uh, heavyweight division in jujitsu in Beijing two years ago. You know, so, you know, raise, raise them as a warrior, raise them tough, get that physical activity. Physical activity is critical, I think, for ADHD and dyslexia uh, uh, people. So that's what I did for my kiddos. That's awesome. That's awesome. I love. Oh, and you know, in physical activity, sea cadets. My, my second son did that. He did a Navy SEAL training for two weeks. So he's trained by Navy SEALs this summer as an 18 year old kid, blowing up stuff, learning how to do you know uh, small unit tactics, uh, fast roping, uh, going into the ocean, and you know scuba diving. Here again, high adrenaline activity, thinking out of the box, giving new experiences, and then doing activity that builds self-esteem, whether that be belts, martial arts, tournaments, you know, tough, uh, you know, physical activity, survival camps, camping. These are critical, I think, for, for people like us. Absolutely. Love it. Love it. Well, these are good, good thoughts. What were you going to say? You're no, gonna go say ahead that. with your next question. So um, some of the things that you're wanting to, to talk about was you know, whenever you were kind of in the weeds with kids in school, like when your kids were younger and they were having struggles, let's say like with homework or, or, or maybe with social situations, with friendships or anything like that, do you have any tips or tricks that you used or that you currently are using right now in your parenting with your kids or any communication strategies or anything like that, that um, were special or unique that you think that, um, would be advice you would give other parents right now um, that are that would be unique to having kids with LD. Anybody want to jump in on that? It's not something everybody has to answer, but if there's anything like that or any homework strategies, anything like that. Well, I I was going to say, I, I would start with um, not shying away from uh, if you're dyslexic, not shying away from dyslexia, not shying away from ADHD, whatever, whatever the situation is, uh, we talk, I mean, it, we joke now, but my middle son called our house, the dyslexia house, because that's all we talked about in understanding, truly understanding about what it is and why it is, um, and the struggles that you go through. So we, we hit this thing head on, um, and we make sure that our children understand what it is and what accommodations and what supports that you get uh, legally. And, you know, our, our kids would uh, probably wouldn't think it's very funny, but every time our child got our children get in the car, uh, the first couple of questions out of my mouth was, how was your day? What'd you learn? Did you have any tests? The last question is, did you get your accommodations? Because I understand that for them to level the playing field at this point before they went through remediation, I, they needed to have these accommodations put in place. They were legally uh, afforded these accommodations and if the teachers didn't do it, we needed to know. So we, we made sure that we opened up those lines of communication uh, and had them start to drive um, 
their education because this is really their education. You know, Eric and, and Brian, we all went through this. This is not, you know, this is my son's dyslexia now. This is something that they have to deal with and they have to move forward with. And, you know, we told our children, hey, the chances of you having a child with dyslexia are pretty high. I mean, they say that 20% of the population is dyslexic. Well, you know, we have five people in our family and three of us are dyslexic. So we're hitting 60%. <laughs> so the chances of you having a child with dyslexia is pretty high. So you need to understand it now and understand how to advocate for yourself because I'm not always going to be here. Mm -hmm. Your mom's not always going to be here. Mm -hmm. That's for yourself. And then you have to make sure that you're able to do it for your children mm -hmm. when they come along. Absolutely. That's being a good dad right there. What do you say to the dads? Because I've heard this before and it's not just dads. Sometimes it's moms, but I hear this amongst moms sometimes is when it comes to getting a child identified or tested, I hear sometimes women say, well, my husband doesn't want our child to receive a label. They don't want my son or my daughter to get a label. So they'd rather not have them tested. Do you guys have anything to say to any dads out there that might be listening to this? I have a whole thoughts? lot to say on that. Okay. Yeah, we got a lot to say. Well, Sorry, uh, I'll let somebody else jump in first, but I, I have a whole lot to say about that one. Okay, good. But please, yes. I'll let Brian. Brian, you got any ideas on this? One? Um, well, you, you know, I, I would say welcome to reality, folks. Uh, whether you have a label of LD, you're going to have several labels that you're going to have throughout life. Mm -hmm. uh, hopefully that you are able to embrace and project out there is, is what's uh, in, important. You know, hopefully educated, kind, you know, well-spoken, uh, thoughtful, things of that sort. And if you have trials and tribulations that are in your past that are LD, uh, uh, so, so be it, embrace it. You know, what I tell my kids, like with dyslexia, uh, you know, when you flip things around on, on a page, uh, it, that, that's difficult for reading. But when you do it out in the wild, you're able to see nuance, uh, you know, um, details that other people can't see when you do the negative of that picture. So you're able to track better. You're a better hunter. Some of the best astrophysicists out there that have been studied are actually dyslexic because when they're looking through the telescope, they're flipping things around. They can see detail better. So when you phrase, okay, hey, we got the label. You're dyslexic. You know, and there's an evolutionary reason why this is here. Whenever you see something larger than three to four percent in the population, there is an av advantage uh, to having that genetic component. So you just embrace the positive aspect of it. And you say, okay, it may take you longer to work with it with how traditional learning is, is out there, but you'll be fine. So, you know, and I think we're getting better with the labels compared to what Stephen, Eric, and I grew up with when it really was what they called as hyperactivity disorder, uh, minimal brain retardation was actually one uh, label that was out there for a while in the 60s and 70s. So that you, you, when you have those type of labels out there, you do have to overcome them. And I can see Stephen, you know, shaking his head that the, when those when the labels like that are thrown on the kids, that's negative. And I don't like that. And I also you know, I tell my kids, what does it tell you about these people that are sitting in ivory towers that they're defining who they think is abnormal and they're sitting in a place of normalcy and basically tell every, you know, all my kids, hey, nobody's normal. You know, no family's functional. You know, everybody has problems, you know, and this is one issue that you want to make it your friend and your ally and not make it your crutch. And I think in today's society, you know, now the term is learning difference. And I like that better. Uh, I actually embrace uh, these labels now because it helps you work the problem, uh, but spinning it in a very positive way. And then very quickly, and we'll, we'll come back to um, uh, the, the, the subject matter about punishment. I don't believe in spanking and, 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 and hitting a kid. Uh, I was raised differently, but I think uh, for parents that are out there who are not ADHD, who have a child that's ADHD or dyslexic, what sometimes can happen is you can get very frustrated with that kid 
And even though you know intellectually the kid's born that way and so on, you can get very frustrated. What I would encourage those parents to do is when before you punish, whatever you're going to do, step back and, and, and then think, am I punishing because of bad intent or am I punishing because of who he is or who she is? If it's because it's who she is or, or, or what, what he is all about genetically, then you want to reframe your, your punishment. Uh, and I think that's also with embracing these kids, instead of them being uh, frustrated with these labels, you try to once again empower them that you got to find within yourself how this is going to affect you in school and with your, your peers, and how are you going to make it a positive attribute in, in your life? Love it. Yeah, so for me, I think, you know, the, the, the reason that you know, if it's a dad that's saying, well, we don't want to get them tested because of the label, mm -hmm. this is a, this whole conversation hinges on one important word and it's called shame, right? Yes. So the, the, the dad who doesn't want the kid labeled is ashamed, right? It's the father's shame that's coming out right there. Now they may say, well, I don't, I don't want to cause problems for my kid, but what they're really doing is they're trading their kids, uh, shame for there so it's gonna by not labeling that kid the kid goes from being learning different to feeling stupid right and that is really not fair for that child to hold that label and, and to, to say well i don't want to i don't want to have a kid with ld so i'm just not going to let you be tested that's how i feel about it and i think that um not getting that kid tested is is a recipe to cause a great deal of shame in their life because they are just not going to feel um like everything's right and they're going to know something's wrong mm -hmm. it's kind of it's the elephant in the room for the child they know they know it's wrong right they know something's wrong and they know they're not you know normal as brian said and they're not keeping up with the kids in their class but they also i think they know in their heart of hearts that they they're they're not, you know, they're not stupid, right? But they, they can't quite figure out why and everything. But if you, if you give them this language to say, hey, I'm LD, that's what I am. I learn differently. Here's how, here's my pathway to learn. And you give them the, the tools and the accommodations that they need. It, it helps tremendously with the shame aspect. And that is the key word for me. And if you don't have that, don't you think it also, I mean, it le leads to major self-esteem issues, depression, more anxiety, mm -hmm. tons of more uh, self-esteem issues. Acting out. Acting out, avoidance, not wanting to go to school. All those things are gonna roll into that. So to not, to not name it, to not give it a name and not tell your child to me is, is I feel like it's kind of abusive. I don't know. That's maybe that's too strong a word, but I, I just feel like it's not right. Yeah, you know, I, I agree with you guys. And what I would do with my kids a lot when they were young, I would say, you know, like Sophia would run in the room and sometimes they'd say, "What type of girl are you?" And she would say, "I'm strong and smart." And I was like, "What else?" And she's like, "Beautiful," you know. And uh, you know, and then when I would put them to bed, sometimes I'd use the Unitarian creed for kids. I just, you know, may your thoughts be wise, may your heart know love, may the work of your hands be blessed all the days of your your life, and just kind of reiterate these positive attributes about what they are all, uh, what they should be about. Because, like you said, uh, Eric, self esteem is critical. And like you were saying, you know, Heather, the, you know, 10,000 pound elephant in the room, if you don't address the issue, because we all have issues. I mean, this is a wonderful learning um, opportunity with a kid saying everybody has some type of problem. You know, yours just happens to be this. And if you, you use it right, I mean, that's why you're an incredible artist. It's how you th see things differently than other people. That's to be welcomed and embraced. Mm hmm. And so see, Steven, I, you I, have I look at opinions. We'd love to hear them. Yeah. And while I understand the learning difference um, thought process, however, I do look at it as a disability. And the reason why I look at it as a disability mm -hmm. is because dyslexia without language, without lexia, is a disability when you're put in a certain situation. Yes. School, sitting at your doctor's office, having to fill out paperwork, having to fill out a job application, 
all of these things, that is where your, your disability shows up yes. without remediation, without training your brain to be able to read and spell, just like anybody else that doesn't have dyslexia. That is where it comes uh, for me. I don't want um, my children to, to sit back and be ashamed of it because we can remediate it. We, there is help out there to allow you to read and spell just like anybody else. So I'm not ashamed of the title dyslexia. Just like if my child went to the doctor and they said, Mr. You're out, your child's diabetic, that's a label. Would I not want to go get my child every help possible for their diabetes? Well, of course I would. Who wouldn't? So to sit back and go, well, I don't want my child labeled is ridiculous. Mm -hmm. You have to have, I say you have to have, you want the label to get provided the supports that your child needs in order to be successful in order to level that playing field, in order for your, your child to be successful in school and move on with life, you need to make sure you understand what it is that you're dealing with. If you don't understand it, you'll never be able to get the correct uh, remediation for it. And therefore, you will be disabled. Mm -hmm. You will. Uh, you, uh, you know, Brian, you, you talked about uh, three different jobs well the last one being prison mm -hmm. well unfortunately yes there's a lot of entrepreneurs that are dyslexic there's a lot of uh highly successful people that are dyslexic but you know what else is full of dyslexics the graveyard and the prison mm -hmm. oh yeah there was a study that was done that showed 89 percent of all suicide notes have dyslexia tendencies, spelling mistakes. Mm -hmm. Texas, the Texas study shows that over 50% of our, our uh, inmate population in Texas has dyslexia. But currently, uh, as of the last time I checked PEAMS data, it was like 2.5% of our population of 5.5 million, roughly 5.5 million kids have dyslexia, but over 50% of our prison population has dyslexia. Yeah, we have something wrong here. Oh yeah. We're, right. we're, we're doing a pay now or pay later uh, mentality. And unfortunately, we're not just paying with uh, that child's life, but everybody else that is associated with that child that cares and loves for that child is affected by that child not receiving the proper care and, and support that they need. Yep. Absolutely. And, and so, you know, for, for those who are listening and wondering why such a high level of prison, I'm using Ned Hallowell's research. He's at Harvard. He wrote Driven to Distraction, Delivered from Distraction, ADHD 2.0, a brilliant mind. And the reason why, as many of you will know, ADHD is, is treated with Ritalin and Adderall, which are basically speed. It's, you know, it's, it's, it, it gives you that kick that a lot of times ADHD needs, people need to be able to think uh, calmly. They need that high adrenaline activity, if you will, or high adrenaline stimulus to be able to think normally. Well, if you don't get it in a controlled environment or you don't get it through sports, and you have poor self-esteem, a lot of times these types gravitate to drug use and bad hydrogen activity, you know, of robbery. Self yeah, self-medication, robbing, you know, and, and doing that, that, that type of, these, these type of uh, unhealthy activities. And that's what leads to a higher percentage of people like Stephen, Eric, and I being in prison uh, than the general population as a whole. Well, Brian, let me, let me jump on there. Well, it's about choices, mm -hmm. right? So I, I sat down and was having a long discussion with our child's, our, our two oldest uh, boys, high school principal. And we were talking about um, dyslexia and ADHD and um, supports in school. And I asked him, I said, so, you know, obviously you're a successful person, you're a principal, you've had to go through a lot of training. 
let me ask you a question. Um, what were you taught about a high school dropout who has dyslexia and ADHD? He goes, nothing good is going to come of them. Mm-hmm. I said, well, you're looking at them. Mm-hmm. So yeah. there is a mentality of that child can't learn, mm-hmm. which is completely false. Mm-hmm. Because no matter how severe the disability is, that child not only can learn, but has, you should respect that child enough to want to give them everything that you have to get them to learn. Mm -hmm. They, you owe it to them if you're in this space, you owe it to them if you're an adult, care for that child, love that child. Be the person to make the difference. I tell teachers all the time, you can be the one that either makes that child or breaks that child. Everybody I've ever spoke to knows the name of the teacher that didn't support them properly. And and they definitely know the name of the teachers that made the difference. Absolutely. Uh, Yeah. So, you know, I think what you're getting at, Stephen, that I've seen in the research is the self-esteem, keeping them in school, giving them multiple opportunities for success, whatever that is. I mean, if the kid is only going to be five foot five and 130 pounds, you don't train them as an offensive lineman. You know, you find him playing squash or you find some type of activity that builds that self-esteem, gives him that outlet that he has his community or she has his community. And that's incredibly important because I was also, you know, uh, threatened, if you will, by the experts, the the Dr. Stephen Maddox at the Child Study Center for Or told my mom, I would develop poor self-esteem, be uh, 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 basically a menace in school most likely would um, drop out of high school and resort to criminal activity. And he was citing sources back, you know, back in 78 and 79 when he gave that information to my mom. I still have my, I still have my diagnosis. (laughs) I still have my diagnosis from uh, Scottish Wright that says, if Stephen doesn't get help now, you need to look into trade school. Well, that brings me to my next thing I was going to bring up. So so yeah, this is interesting. So you got all these write-ups that said how you were going to turn out and, and what was going to happen next. So part of what I, my next question was going to be is how do you prepare your, your students and your kids to, you know, launch to the next period? So I know that Brian's done that. We have a son that's 14 going on 15. And then Steven has his kids. We all have had our own personal traumas and experiences. So, you know, what's, What's the game plan to prepare our kids to get on to the next level in life, whatever that may be, as I don't think it needs to be college for everybody. And I think, you know, we got to figure out what the right thing is for each child. Um, but, so what is your, what is, uh, what are you kind of thinking or how do you prepare? How do we prepare our students for this? Who wants to start? I, I would say, cause I just had this conversation today okay. uh, about it. It, it's about opportunity, right? People, I hear this all the time, and, and the school system preaches this all the time, where they tell the, the, the young men, especially the kids who have ADHD, dyslexia, maybe other learning disabilities, you know what? College isn't for everybody. Okay. That is a cop-out. That is a cop-out of the school system not understanding how to provide the services to remediate the child to allow them to go to college, there's okay. nothing wrong with trade. Oh yeah, my wrong. my entire dad's side of the family was carpenters, and master carpenters. Mm-hmm. My grandfather, master carpenter, built half of uh, South Dallas, Oak Cliff area, the homes over there. So there's nothing wrong with that, but it is the opportunity. The child should be able to make a choice yes. whether they want to go this path or they want to go to college. Well, how do they know they don't want to go to college? The only reason why they're going to say, I don't want to go to college is because they're unsuccessful in high school, middle school, and elementary school, and and school is a source of pain for them. I I, I had this discussion with a a teacher, and she was like, oh, wait, you know what? Trade is good. Look at a plumber. Plumbers make so much money. While they absolutely do. However, 
most plumbers, I, and I'm using most, you have to make uh, you have to either own the business in order to make the, that huge salary. But I also say, well, what does a plumber have his hands in all the time, every day? What is an electrician doing? They're up and down on ladders. How do you think that affects your body? You're one, it's the same thing as being a, a pro athlete. You're one accident away from never being able to work in that profession again, mm-hmm. being electrocuted, uh, drowning, uh, you know, falling off a ladder in construction. Then what? You don't have an education. You don't have a, any other way to make money at that point. So don't just blanket statement saying, well, you have a learning disability or, you know what, college isn't for everybody. So let's don't you, – you shouldn't have to worry about going that direction. No, well, here's college is thing. for everybody. We just have to make sure that they, are, they have the opportunity to make that choice. I think one thing a lot of people don't get you know, is there is a college for everybody, Absolutely. right? And what a lot of people get hung up on is they want to get into a very specific school, right? Whether it be an Ivy League school, you know, like Brian over here, uh, maybe it's it, maybe it's the state school that they want to go to, the big state school. Those schools, of course, lots of people want to get into. They have waiting lists. They're very competitive. They're super hard to get to. And most students are not going to get into that school, right? Most students are going to be disappointed during the application process, dyslexic or not, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, what, but there's thousands and thousands of colleges that are dying for students and they're very good schools. They're not bad schools. Their educations are still excellent educations with dedicated professors. Many of these schools the professors are focused more on teaching, right, than they are in some of the research-oriented institutions. So by, by definition, you're probably going to get some better teachers that will impart information in a really powerful way. Um, so, you know, if, if people could just change a little bit their perspective on exactly which school they, they think they want to go to. Or they, what they, college they think they need their child to get to. Or, yeah. yes, and parents could change their perspective on, oh, well, I went to, you know, um, you know, UT Austin, you need to go to UT Austin, right? Or whatever that, whatever that need is that the parent has. If they could change their perspective a little bit, there is a college that is going to be a good fit for your student. Yeah, you know, on, on that note, you know, I like what Mike Angelo said. He said the curse of humanity is not that they raise their bar too high and they fail at trying to achieve it, is that they raise their bar low and meet it. Most people are capable of doing a lot more than what they currently are doing. And the stats are pretty dramatic uh, in two areas. The first area I like to approach is when uh, and I'm, I'm I I'm I'm citing Director Farnham, who was in the Economic Development Division of our uh, government back in the '90s, and he gave a talk at Phillips Exeter Academy when I was teaching there uh, in a summer school session. Uh, this is a prep school up in New Hampshire. He cited stats that if you only have a high school education, each year your earning potential decreases three percent below inflation. And inflation is around 3%. So you're basically 6% difference each year. If you have a college degree, your earning potential in whatever profession you do stays up with inflation. It grows 3% every year. And if you have a graduate degree, you're basically around 10% above inflation with whatever uh, salary that you're at. So it would behoove most people if they can find uh, the way to find a good school and get higher level education that they should. Now, what's interesting, there was a Wall Street Journal article just a month ago that came out that said there's this huge disparity between men and, when, uh, men and women uh, in going to school. Right now, 60% of all college students are women and 40% are men. And one of the big reasons why is that a lot of men are early diagnosed with LD because of their uh, girls with LD are not diagnosed as frequently because they don't have that hyperactivity testosterone, you know, basically acting out that little boys have. 
So a higher percentage of boys are being basically one to three ratio being diagnosed as LD. A lot of times they develop poor self-esteem. School is a negative experience. So they don't go off to college. So we're actually seeing a decrease in the male population going. Not the Wall Street Journal will say not because they're not capable. It's because they're demoralized by the time they get to that level. So these are important things to consider when you're forming your child and giving them the vision of where they can go and what they should do. Uh, I mean, you know, here again, there definitely are some people that should go right into the military, go into being a fireman uh, or a police uh, officer. Uh, and these are all great professions and don't necessarily require a four year education at University of Texas. But I think we need to encourage the bulk of our, our youth to continue on and get to that high level. Because if you look at what the GI Bill did, did to America after World War II, it made us a world power because it allowed all these guys coming home. 16 million people went through the military during World War II. Most of them would have never gone to college. But because of the GI Bill after World War II, they did go to college and it transformed our country into a world power. We never need to, for, we should never forget that, so. Yeah. Really good advice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, really good. Well, and the other thing that I think is interesting, like Mark Cuban said this, he said that the number one uh, job skill that we'll be needing, you know, over the next decade is creativity. That's the number one job skill. It's not reading, it's not spelling, it's not sitting still in a chair while somebody lectures at you for eight hours. It's being creative. And what do dyslexics and ADD and, and LD people have in common? It's usually creativity right that's one of our greatest strengths and uh so if you can just kind of and this is what i'll tell my kids you know and do tell my kids like let's just slog through this stuff you don't like so well because you know once you get to you know for me actually college was great because college became opened up this world of of debate right yeah, liberal arts education liberal arts yeah. of of let's let's have a socratic discussion right uh that became exciting and i Thrived. I love that. Right. So that was an area where suddenly the things that I was good at talking uh, <laughs> were appreciated versus, you know, in, in middle school, they really didn't like it when I talked. They're like, no, 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 don't no talking in class, you know. So very different, very different. Um, so, yeah, I think that's another thing to think about, too, is kind of if we're talking about the subject of launching, it's about helping your kids have a vision for, hey, there's actually a lot of fun things to do on the other side of this, right? Yes. In your career, in business, you know, in, you know, in college or, or whatever you choose to do next, right? Be an entrepreneur, start your business, whatever that might be. Um, there's a lot of opportunity to do cool, fun things that aren't the classroom environment that you're in right now yeah and like my kids they get hung up on oh well i'm not making a good grade on my spelling test and i'm like really we don't care we don't care about your spelling test at all we don't even think you should have a spelling test because when you grow up you're going to be using technology and your technology is going to auto correct all of your spelling anyways so we don't really want you to be stressed out about your spelling test we want you to try your hardest you do your best and you forget the rest but that's not something we really want you that stressed out over and you just you know you have your certain things you focus on but that's just not something that we stress about so i have a question I have Go ahead. a question so um my question to you guys is what is the father's role in the educational process i think most of us would agree traditionally um the mother takes the much more active role in communicating with the school, selecting the teachers, um, attending the yard meetings. You don't usually get to select teachers, by the way. Whatever. Uh -huh. Right. You get what I'm saying, though. Uh, you can tell I'm really plugged in. <laughs> so, I'm so, I'm so, so glad. And, that and where, where does the dad fit into that, right? Because I think a lot of moms are like, okay, I'm going to take this. And how does the dad fit in? When is it important for the dad to interject themselves? Um, what's the dad's role? I, I'm glad that you brought this up because this is one of the things that I tell fathers all the time. Good. The dad's role is standing shoulder to shoulder with the mom, making all educational decisions at the same time. It's a unified front. 
your the fathers need to be in these Arden 504 committee meetings. Every time that there is one, you, you better act like it's a sporting event and be there. Because the meetings go completely different when the father is sitting in the room also. I don't know why. I'm not here to debate why. It just changes the tone of the meeting and what needs to happen with a child and the support that needs to happen. You know, I handled a lot of the meetings because my wife worked for the school district. So she said, hey, since I work for the school district, I'm going to allow, you know, well, I'm saying I'm going to allow, but Stephen's going to handle the majority of the meetings. However, she's there, but she allows me to talk and me to be the voice for our family. That way it's not a conflict of interest or, or back and forth with the school district, but it is so vitally important for the fathers to be a part of um, the art meetings and the 504 meetings and understanding what is actually going on with their child in school. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I agree with Stephen totally. Get, getting involved, uh, working together with, with your spouse. I mean, obviously, every couple gravitates to certain things that they're, uh, you know, more uh, expertise. Uh, I mean, ex expert in, and, you know, my ex was good about organizing and keeping all the, uh, the therapy sessions going and so on. And I was basically always providing the high adrenaline activity. I was teaching them martial arts, teaching them how to do basketball, teaching them how to throw a ball, teaching them how to, you know, break boards, you know, how to, how to survive in the wild, how to fish, hunt. And I think that that's something that also teaching them actively doing stuff with them uh, is something that's very important for, for dads to do, to have that time. I did a lot of camping. So I had a lot of one-on-one -on -one with them out in nature. I think that's very important for everybody, but ADHD and dyslexic types. And getting back to what Stephen was saying, as far as the therapy and the school and the teachers, yeah, I think, and I, I think men in general in this generation are getting more involved. In fact, our American women are pulling them, sometimes kicking and screaming to get more involved. And so we don't have a choice to some degree, but I think it's very important that they have done this with us because like Heather was saying, it, it's been a, and, and Eric was as well, that you know, traditionally women have actually taken on this, this role. And I yeah. think, you know, being a part of that, that is something that's a very, very important to do that men have traditionally not done. Yeah, in our family, I mean, Heather certainly takes the lead as far as organizing, you know, uh, whether it be a speech therapy or this or that, but I've always been present and, and, and active in, you know, when we had the ARD meetings, when our kids were going through that, um, I was always there for those. And then, um, you know, even today, doing the parent-teacher conferences, and my role in those meetings is twofold, but I, I will agree with you, Stephen. The tenor of the meeting, I think, is different when I'm in the room. And um, and also with Eric being dyslexic, he brings that perspective sure, yeah. that I can't bring. Um, because That's, of yeah. the severity of the kid's dyslexia, he can speak to it uh, to a level that I can't speak to it when it comes to advocating for specific things. Yeah. So we had an experience recently with uh, the one of uh, one of our kids reading teacher and they were doing the silent reading portion of their day and um, it was I don't know probably 20 minutes of silent reading and you know keep in mind this is one of our kids who is not fluently able to read at this point so they are a, a non-reader and they're at and the, the teacher and my kid was coming home upset about this and feeling like he just completely didn't know what to do. He was just bored off his ass. And, you know, it was just not a good experience. And he was feeling dumb, right? It was hurting his self-esteem. And she was like, well, he's really good. He's not disruptive. It's great. He's great. I said, no, he's not great. This is not a great activity. I, and I expressed her directly. I said, I did this as a kid. I was forced to do silent reading. I could not read. I spent 20 minutes staring at the page, thinking about how dumb I was and thinking about how the other kids were doing something that I didn't know how to do. It was one of the most devastating 20 minutes of meditation on how I wasn't keeping up, right? 
And I said, I really don't appreciate it, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And she was like, <gasps> she'd never thought about it like that. And so I think being able to testify. And so what I would impart to fathers who are watching this is if you are LD, tell your truth, tell your story and speak it to the teachers because it's a point of view that they have not heard is an adult saying, this is what I went through. This is real. I am successful today and here's how I am successful. And, and what you're doing to my son or daughter is not working. And here's the way that I'd like to see it done differently. Yeah. That's a, and another thing that I, I found that I worked with my kids, uh, so I don't think that it's looked at an awful lot. And there's more and more research, especially in Ned Hallowell's ADHD 2.2 book, 2.0 book. And that is our brains are different. They're finding more and more research that there's a genetic component to dyslexia and ADHD. Uh, and there's overwhelming research that I have found that diet is critical. So if you can, having an all natural diet, staying away from artificial flavors, colors and preservatives and junk food, we know in general that's good for your health. But it, there seems to be a correlation, and I'm citing some research done by Benjamin Feingold that was done in the 70s, that when you take kids with ADHD and dyslexia and you give them all natural food and don't give them Jolly Ranchers and Pop-Tarts and Lucky Charms and all this other junk, anything that looks like it came out of the Star Wars movie, don't eat, <laughs> they see a huge difference in being able to learn and concentrate. And, and, and so it seems like we have more sensitive brains to synthetic chemicals. And that's another thing that I've really imparted to my kids. And I think it's made a huge difference uh, as well. So besides getting involved with the teachers and giving the perspective of what, you know, being an advocate saying, okay, this is what I went through. This is how I think uh, we should do things. And I had a lot of teacher uh, conferences with Justin, my middle kid at Shelton. And these kids, these teachers are experts. But, you know, I told them this is what helped me. And, and they, you know, Miss Ratcliffe, uh, she used some of it uh, to my knowledge on Justin. And it works. So I think that's a great point that you bring out, Eric, that letting the teachers know what helped you become successful will help them kind of focus on what they need to be doing with your own kid that has your genetic material. Yeah, exactly. Absolutely. Because everybody you know, has their unique thing that worked or didn't work. So it's nice to have some teachers that can be flexible from time to time. Well, I guess at this point, we're just going to you know, talk about last final thoughts yeah, from final, a father's perspective. Any, any, any fatherly advice that you would like uh, parents to know, any fathers to know who might be new on this journey, uh, who maybe uh, to any fathers out there who uh, have a, a child that's struggling that was recently identified uh, they're overwhelmed. They're, they're trying to figure out what to do. Any fatherly advice for the dads out there? I'll jump in. Um, I, I'll, start, I'll go back to uh, echoing what Eric had said earlier. Um, it's your child. It's your baby. Love your child, right? Your child's not damaged. Mm -hmm. Your child needs remediation. Put your arms around them, love them, and show them the way. Show them how to get through to the other side, because there is the other side. You know, we talk about, uh, you know, we talk about dyslexia as being a long, dark tunnel a lot of times. And there's a lot of people walking around in the dark, don't know which way to go. Make sure that you, if you get to the other side, go back and get some other people. Go back and help them. Show them the way. Show them how to provide the services for their children. Don't be ashamed of being dyslexic or having ADHD or being autistic. You're not damaged. You're valuable. And show your kids their value. Yeah, I, I agree, agree with Stephen. I mean, you know, just reiterating that they're, they're different. Uh, they're unique. And that's fine. Uh, and I think, you know, I mean, I, I just turned 50 this year. I mean, when I was 19, I was brilliant. You know, now I'm, I realize there's so much to learn. And if I start, you know, standing on a pedestal saying what people should do and not do, I'm, I'm sure I'll swiftly get knocked off. But in my primitive view of life so far, I think 99% of parenting is just showing up 
and being being strong uh, presence and not getting frustrated. For people who are ADHD uh, that have kids with ADHD and dyslexia, you know, be patient. You know, uh, I think sometimes we get impatient going, you know, hey, you, you need to get ahead of where I was. And I, I, I felt I probably was at fault with this a lot of times. I was like, okay, well, I couldn't read when I was, you know, in first, second and third grade. My kid's going to read in kindergarten. You know, be patient. Don't stress out. If you're getting the resources, giving the love and giving the right, you know, frame of, of, of mind uh, to how to approach the, the issue. I think that's good for parents who are ADHD, dyslexic with kids with ADHD and, and dyslexia. Um, those who are not ADHD and dyslexia that are raising kids, I would encourage you to sometimes when you get very frustrated, try to find that comfort place where you can you can reshape the way that you're looking at things i think a lot of times people who are not adhd and dyslexic sometimes the research shows they wish their kids were not born that way it's frustrating why can't you be normal you know and that's what you know that, that you're not a perpetual fountain of love is okay but realize when that frustration comes out here again are you punishing or looking at the kid because of uh, malicious intent that they did something or are you upset because of who they are? And if you're upset because of who they are, just kind of back up and realize, okay, they are this way because of their genetics and try to find a place where you look at them differently. Because a lot of times parents can get extremely frustrated. They may not say anything, but kids are very, very sensitive to that. And here again, when you're building that self-esteem, you don't want to come across going, why can't you do this? You know, and so getting educated, I think, is very important for the people who are not ADHD and, dys and dyslexic, uh, you know, who are parents. And here again, to reiterate, for those of us who are being more patient, being being firm in the direction that you're sending your kids that they're going to be OK, work the problem and just continually, you know, be there for them to help them work the problem that they're going to be fine. Very well said. Yeah, honestly, you guys both said kind of what I was going to say um, is don't let your own experience get in the way of being a good father, right? And I think that when I've had my moments that I'm not proud of, where I wasn't doing a great job as a dad, we've all had that. Yeah. Um, it's usually because I let my own feelings or my own anxiety or my own shame boil up and I took it out on my kid, right? I saw them failing at something and, and it upset me because of my experience, not because of who they were, or what they were really doing. It was my experience that was coming out in a, in a negative way. Mm -hmm. And so just not that everybody's always perfect, but if I think if we as dads are aware of that, particularly dads that have some sort of LD, if you're aware of that and you can kind of get ahead of it, it's much healthier than if you're taking out your own frustrations about your life experience on your kids. Uh, that's where we get into a really vicious cycle. Um, so that's my closing thought. Very well said. Well, you guys all did a phenomenal job sharing, you know, from your heart uh, and, you know, your head of all of your experiences with your kids. I know it's not always easy to share all of this, but hopefully it was able to shed some light and, help inspire some other parents out there who are walking on this journey and realizing that they're not alone. And hopefully it was able to give some people some hope. So thank you guys so much for everything tonight. And hopefully we can work together again soon. Yeah, thanks again. Thank you guys so much. And thanks to our sponsors, Shelton and Fairhill for generously helping to support this organization. And uh, those of you guys who are watching, remember, you know, we are 100% supported through uh, the support of the community and, you know, these two sponsors that we have, but the sponsors only make up about 10% of our total uh, uh, fundraising needs and the rest of it comes from individuals like you. So if you like this programming, you want to see more, uh, please, you know, uh, remember to be generous and help support us. And this is how we can continue to bring great programming and events to the community. So thank you so much. Uh, everybody uh, that's been a part of this journey for us. Yeah, thank you so much. You guys have a great night. Yeah, thank you for All having right. me. Thank you for this. Happy holidays. You too. Take care. Take care. See you soon.